Good evening, everyone. We'll sit tight for just a moment, let everyone join the event, and then I'll get us started in just a few seconds. All right, hello and good evening. Welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Josie, the events and marketing manager here at Greenlight, and I'm so thrilled to be hosting tonight's event with the editors and some contributors from this year's The Best American Poetry Anthology. We'll hear from and speak with Matthew Zapruder, this year's editor, David Lehman, the series editor, and numerous contributing poets. So you are in for a really excellent evening. Um, before we start, just wanna say a huge thanks to all of our guests tonight and for the team at Scrivener for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. We are grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Now, just a couple of housekeeping things. First, in our Zoom webinar tonight, you can he see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. Uh, they can see that you're here though, and you are welcome um, to share anything you want in the chat this evening. Um, cheer for the authors, let us know where you are, where you're from, um, which we highly encourage. And importantly, um, tonight's featured book, The Best American Poetry 2022 Anthology is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. As a thank you for attending tonight's virtual event, we're offering 10% off the collection. You can enter the coupon code GREENLIGHTEVENTS10 in the coupon discount section at checkout online for 10% off. I'll share all of this in the chat later. Um, but now on to the good stuff. Matthew Zapruder, the guest editor of this year's Best American Poetry, is the author of five collections of poetry, most recently Father's Day, as well as Why Poetry, a Book of Prose. He is editor at large at Wave Books, where he edits contemporary poetry, prose, and translations. He teaches in the MFA program in English department at St. Mary's College of California. He lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, we also have tonight David Lemon. We talked earlier. I immediately mispronounced his name exactly as he said I would. <laughs> um, <laughs> But David is the series editor of the Best American Poetry and is also the editor of the Oxford Book of American Poetry. His 11 books of poetry include The Morning Line, Playlist, Poems in the Manner of, and so much more. The most recent of his many nonfiction books is 100 Autobiographies, a Memoir. He lives in New York City and Ithaca, New York. I'm gonna turn things over to David and Matthew to start us off now, and then we'll hear from the stunning roster of poets. So please take it away. Thank you so much, Josie. Thank you, Greenlight Bookstore. And may I double your thanks or second your thanks to all the other people involved in organizing this event, Mia, Rebecca Jett, Jean Yoon, and, uh, and thank you to all of our many contributors. We would have liked to have all 75 contributors take part, but uh, time is, is finite. And um, what we are planning to do is to have each poet read his, her, or their poem uh, uh, in an order that we'll announce. If there's time afterwards, we can um, entertain questions. We could have a free for all where people might want to read a second poem from the volume. And uh, I should just say that uh, this is the 34th volume in a series that began in 1988. And that was not supposed to endure for more than two or three years because poetry doesn't sell enough to make it worth the publisher's while. But here we are 34 books later, uh, which is a triumph for poetry. and makes you feel pretty good about how uh, poetry can flourish even in times that are not necessarily propitious. And it's been a pleasure to work with Matthew Zapruder. Matthew is the man who made the choices for this year's 
anthology took the job very seriously. And, uh, and the result is a terrific book that you're all in. Uh, and uh, so a tip of the non-existent fedora to my friend, Matthew. Now I'd like to read one poem from the volume before uh, asking Matthew to uh, follow. And he will be followed by Dara who will read first, Major Jackson second, uh, Camille Dungy third, and everyone knows the order after that. Uh, the poem I'd like to read is by Dean Young. Dean uh, passed away very recently. And although he was of frail health, his death nevertheless is a, is a shock. And uh, as it happens, he wrote a poem that Matthew liked well enough to include. And uh, I'm going to read it. I think it's pretty good. And it's very characteristic of, uh, of its author. It's called Spark Theory by Dean Young. Things flow from one thing to another. A hearse pulls up and idles. Some plywood makes a peep. Dark shapes in the doorway can't be helped. It's not an insufficiency of electricity that we need to worry about. The stuff's just bouncing off the streets. The hearse is yellow with pollen the hearse almost covered with snow. There is always this flow, rowboats, marriages, upside down rainbows of spilled gasoline. Here comes a strange mailman. Here comes a chihuahua chewing a rubber band. Here comes otherness in a flimsy dress. A bird flies into a cotton tree, a love letter crammed in a mannequin's head. What she said that day by the water with the ashes making their arabesques, simultaneously not being here yet, being nowhere else, occasions for evaporation, perfumes of the incinerated instance, a man carried from his own house in pieces like a harp. That was Spark Theory by Dean Young. It appeared in the magazine Conduit, an excellent magazine whose editor, uh, uh, incidentally, William Waits, is also represented in this year's an anthology. Now, with, uh, without further ado, and uh, mindful of our time constraints, which have never been spelled out, but I'm imagining are uh, tight, uh, I'd like to turn this over to Matthew Zapruder. Thanks, David. Thank you for reading um, Dean's poem. Um, thank you for doing that. And it's great to see all these poets. I can't see the audience. Thank you all for being here. Before I forget, I want to thank Greenlight Books for hosting us and for being very patient with my logistical ineptitude. Um, and I want to thank David, um, who's a wonderful person to work with. And I'm be, I, I, I know this word is overused, but I really am like utterly honored and still kind of stunned to find myself on this list of people who preceded me who did this task. So, and I really want to give all the time to the poets. So I'm just going to say um, one last thing, which is that um, I love every single poem that's in this book. And it was such a pleasure to go back and look at them again. And I'm just so thrilled that these poets can be here reading and I look forward to more readings so we can include as many of the poets in this anthology who would like to participate. So without any more ado, I will I will uh, give way to my really close friend and former teacher to whom I'm very grateful, Darewar. Hi. So uh, I'm Dara Barwa Dixon, and uh, this poem is called Remembering. As if every time you did it, you started beeping to warn others not to get run over by your memories. As if every time you did it, you started thinking to warn others not to get run over by your memories. 
as if every time you did it, you started weeping, as if every time you started bleeding by your memories, just enough to warn others not to get run over. After a night of epic nightmares populated by strangers by the thousands, after finding in a marked up copy of a book called Poetics of Space, a note to myself printed in blue ink in all caps, it says marked with the sign of the first time. Another note in the script says, there is a tie that binds us to our homes. This is a motto on a deck of cards showing two dogs chained to a doghouse. And on, and on the Poetic of Space's last page, an inside back cover, I wrote a list. The house, the gallery, four rooms, red trim, sickness, sleep talk, oil lamps, flit can, mirrors, our road, up front, back behind, our mule, fields, the road, the river, the boats, the wake, the railroad, shell roads, the levee, the batcher, the cemetery, the tunnel, the bridge, blue angels, deer range, lake hermitage, castanets, wild geese, snakes, mink, lizards, cranes, songbirds. Thank you. Thank you, Dara. I'm Major Jackson, and I want to thank uh, Matthew um, for including this poem, but also to say it's such a pleasure to read with uh, everyone and having uh, read a good deal of this uh, anthology. I'm just a fan of, of not only the poets, but the art. Uh, once again, it's like a big reboot for me this time of year. So thank you, Matthew. This is uh, in the spirit of praise is called Ode to Everything. Somehow, I have never thought to thank the ice cream cone for building a paradise in my mouth. And can you believe I have never thought to thank the purple trout lily for demonstrating its six-petaled dive or the yellow circle in a traffic light for illustrating patience, my bad. In my life, I have failed to praise the postman whose loyalty is epic, the laundress who treasures my skinny jeans and other garments, and the auto repairman who clangs a wrench inside my car, tightening her own music. Where my name called and I were summoned on a brightly lit stage to accept a little statue after staring in utter disbelief. I would thank my dentist, as well as my neighbor, who sits vigil beside the dying far away from the lights, and my fourth grade teacher, who brought down three tape rulers on my hands as punishment for daydreaming out a window during an exam I already completed, mea culpa. Now that I know the value of the peaks across from Flanders Hill, I will forever express reverence for their green crowns. I will never fail again to say small devotions for the scar on a friend's face that lengthens when I walk into a room. Thank you. Uh, Camille, it's- uh... I know, here I am. I was, I was trying to remember if we were being introduced or we were just going and we're just going. Hi, I'm Camille Dungey. I'm Speaking to you right now from Walla Walla, Washington, Whitman College, where I'm uh, on a visiting professorship. Let me, 
Let me tell you, America, this one last thing. I will never be finished dreaming about you. I had a lover once, if you could call him that. I drove to his apartment in a faraway town like the lost bear who wandered to our cul-de-sac that summer smoke from the burning mountain altered our air. I don't know what became of her. I drove to so many apartments in the day. America, this is really the very last thing. He'd stocked up for our weekend together on food he knew I would like, vegetarian pad thai, some black bean and sweet potato chili, coconut ice cream, a bag of caramel popcorn, loads of Malbec. He wanted to make me happy, but he drank until I would have been a fool not to be afraid. I'd been drinking plenty too. It was too late to drive myself anywhere safe. I watched him finger a brick as if to throw it at my head. Maybe that's a metaphor. Maybe that's what happened. America, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference with you. All I could do was lock myself inside his small bedroom. I pushed a chest against the door and listened as he threw his body at the wood, listened as he tore apart the pillow I had sewn him. He'd been good to me, but this was like waiting for the walls to ignite. You've heard that, America? In a firestorm, most houses burn from the inside out. An ember caught in the eaves, wormed through the chinking, will flare up in the insulation on the frame until everything in the house succumbs to the blaze. In the morning, I found him on the couch, legs too long, arms spilling to the carpet, knuckles bruised in the same pattern as a hole in the drywall. Every wine bottle empty. Each container of food opened, eaten, or destroyed. I didn't want you to have this, he whispered. If he could not consume my body, the food he'd given me to eat would have to do. Have you ever seen a person walk through the ruins of a burnt out home? Please believe me, I am not making light of such suffering, America. Maybe the dream I still can't get over is that so far I have made it out alive. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shang Yang Fang and I'm with Camille. I'll read the poem, A Bulldozer's American Dream. I think never can pronounce the word bulldozer. At the construction site, the bulldozer works days and nights. No, it is the man inside who works. The man and his machine are one. After the stars and dogs and coffees brewed with hands of his loved one, her night hair of soft river, of his own volition, the man chose to participate in this heavy lifting labor. Wrong. It's the machine that does. No more than 25, the man forearm nodded, grips the handle and the machine's hydraulic stick follows, an extension of his body and to that extent his mind. His mind as we know it does not want to be a man or anything with a preconceived structure. But how can he resist this pleasure? His thighs harvesting, his glazed nape taut as a stag skin discharging summer rain. It is the mind that cannot resist this sweet perk of the earth. It is the mind that tames the bulldozer's tender monstrosity and orders it to pick up with connivance those dusk damaged bones for its must master and dig into the deep delved darkness and interior otherwise unattainable.
Some evenings, the man leaves the construction site for stakes and candles and wine thick as plague blood, musing the neck of his wife, whose good flesh is continuous as his dreams in which the earth will never betray him, for he is his filial son, competent at his duty, fill the earth and subdue it. Then the machine without its master lowers its bucket in rain. Then through the hard lattice work of this city, its metal drilled by a known silence, it hurts to look at it, a sad thing. The machine still is not a part of anything. Hey, thank you. Hi, my name is Brian Janay, uh, or Breezy, and this is my poem, Capitalism. Capitalism. The best thing I can do for my mama is stay out her pocket. This gets true the older I get, but it's been true since I got here. At the grocery store checkout, I suck my teeth and curse the air. What the hell did I buy? My voice almost as sharp as my mother's, except everything in this cart's for me. I pick up my privilege and push past her shadow where she still stands scouring the receipts for error. Double scan, a missed discount, the usual trickery. In high school, when they ask what I want to do when I grow up, I say not starve and mean it. I don't dream of excess or labor. My mama works hard. Her daddy worked hard. All my ancestors were worked hard. In Boston, the white teacher at the white school in the white neighborhood where the black women hold the little white hands of the bright eyed blonde children like work visas looks dead in my face and says her grandfather worked hard. And that's why they have that house on Martha's Vineyard. In her wedding photos, she smiles in her ivory dress with her ivory bow and the white pillars of her grandfather's white house rise up to frame them. Thank you. So incredible, it's such a pleasure to be here. These poems are remarkable and I just got my copy. Uh, Matthew, thank you so much for doing this work. My father's mustache. Let us pause to applaud the white bell-bottom suit, the wide flared collar, the black thick coiffed hair. In this photo of my father, he is sent of himself at a gathering off Sonoma Highway in the early 70s. I can't stop looking at the photo. There is a swagger that feels almost otherworldly epic, like Lorca expounding in Buenos Aires, not the form, but the marrow of form. He is perfect there, my father in the photo. I feel somehow as if I am perched on a bay laurel branch nearby, though not born yet. It's in black and white, the photo. You can see his grin behind his lush mustache. Is it time that moves in me now, a sense of ache and unraveling, my father in his pristine white suit, the eye of the world barely able to handle his smooth, unbroken stride. It's been a year since I've seen him in person. I miss how he points to his apple trees and I miss his smooth face that no longer has the mustache I always adored. As a child, I once cried when he shaved it. Even then, I was too attached to this life. Hi, my name is Jessenia Montilla. And um, I just wanna say thank you, Matthew, for choosing this poem, How to Greet a Warbler for Christian Cooper. Today, walking in the tall grass, close to home, mask on, ears wide, I spotted a warbler, all yellow bellied with its human eyes and soft tongued song. And I imagined 
how we could have lost another one of us to the kind of violence only whiteness is allowed to dream up and enact. His wings were rousing up dirt in protest as if he too was envisioning loss. And I swear, I wanted to kneel before him and make of him a church. I'm Cynthia Parker Rene, and my poem is In Virginia. In Virginia's room, her own. Peruvian lilies light her desk with carefully placed pens, bought with her own words. The groovings in the desk waxed by Pearlene who at noon stirs Earl Grey in a pink apron carrying pink teacups laced with lemon on its pungent lip. Delicate woman-sized treats for swooning. Pearling moves to the door to bring in the silk road porcelain tub, camphor, salts, and tints of violet to balm Virginia's tuckered feet. Unbend the curvature of Virginia's back, the enamored, covetous prose in Virginia's own. Pearly, she calls, bring my notebooks and more tea. Pearlene walks hard into the kitchen to draw the fires, prepare domesticity for the writer who needs a room of her own to subordinate her muse. Her maid who labors for Miss Virginia's ownness, her roomingness. Virginia says the room frees her from the tyranny of man, her men, planters and industrialists. Carlene is asked to stay late to prepare refreshments for her writer friends to collect their wet coats and dry them by the hearth and pleasantly waitress their personalities. Pearlene Agreeable prepares the table, embosses it with fairies and musing mermaids taper flickering. Nights when Pearlene walks to her bus stop, fresh from clanking silver goblets of drink she has never tasted, goes to the butcher for the leftover shanks of meat closest to the guts of his porcelain body for her own family stewed victuals. At home, she draws the fire for her children's nightly bath, washes clothes for school on the morrow, braids their hair. After all and sundry, has been cared for. She walks to the pallet she shares and thinks of Virginia's ownness, the ownness that she, Pearlene, keeps pristine from the tyranny of Mistress Virginia's men. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Greetings. Hi. Um, I want to thank Matthew, of course, for selecting this poem. Um, and I want to thank Greenlight for doing this uh, great event tonight. And I also want to thank APR where the poem first appeared. Uh, it's called Follow Them. It's this poem is one of six or seven poems in the anthology whose uh, beginning uh, was inspired by the Michigan-Ohio State game. Follow them. Heartbroken over a football game, autumn evening, of this kind of thing I'm not ashamed, nor of the twistiness of that diction, or wanting America to burn, though only certain parts deserve to die. The forests are beautiful and have done nothing wrong. 
Even the desert's emptiness is beautiful, though it terrifies me, and tacos and kebabs wrapped up in naan. And today, walking through the park, I turn to see dozens of bright white seagulls flocked on the windy lake against the blue sky. And I felt an ache and I sent a text to a friend. I said, today I saw flocked on the lake white seagulls. It was beautiful. He wrote, follow them. It was too late. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. And uh, thank you everybody who's read um, and everyone in the anthology and Matthew and David for putting this together. And thanks to Greenlight Bookstore. Um, this poem is called Modern Poetry and it describes my entry into the world of poems. It was what I'd been waiting for my whole life, but I wasn't ready for poetry. I didn't have the tools. Retke, I appreciated the greenhouse poems and decades later saw his bed, toilet, upright piano in that desolate town where he was raised, not unlike the desolate town where I was raised. No greenhouse in my town, but the green giant factory where mushrooms grew on cow shit. Wallace Stevens, I wrote a paper on loneliness in Jersey City, having no clue what he meant by the deer and the dachshund are one and got an A anyway by faking it. The professor made us read Sunday morning, which struck me as long. I couldn't focus yet. I was 18. A poem against heaven, he told us. Is there no change of death in paradise? Does ripe fruit never fall? That I could understand, having known some plums and that icky sweet smell of a dead mouse in the wall. Gerard Manley Hopkins, not modern per se, but my professor said one of the first modernists. So what did modern poetry really mean? Maybe just fucked up as Hopkins was for sure and tongue twistery and depressed Jesuit, maybe bipolar. I stared at his photograph, the long nose and cleft in his chin, noticed that even in no worse, there is none. He had the wherewithal to put in the accent marks to school us as to how to hear the thing. And WCW, Williams, my roommate and I called him Billy C. Billy Goat. I knew something of wheelbarrows, old women, and as I said, plums, but the prof showed us how complicated it all really was, the whole no ideas but in things thing the near rhymes, depends, and chickens, and red. Again, I was not yet capable of being smart and wondered if I ever would be, though I kept getting A's on the papers, maybe because the professor felt sorry for me, and I'm not just saying that. The final modern poet was Sylvia Plath, a woman, blonde, and I didn't trust blondes, smart, angry, angry at men, I was told, depressed, cheated on, dead. I imagined her being in modern poetry with us, mopping the floor with us, with her developed mind, her ooh and ah sounds, her thesis, the magic mirror on the double in Dostoevsky. I pictured her calling me a charlatan, like Gaylord did in class the week we studied her. He called her a charlatan psychopath and me a charlatan for sticking up for her. I had to go back to the dorm and look up charlatan in the dictionary. A fraud, the dictionary said, a quack, which yes, I was, though so was Gaylord, who isn't a quack at 18. 
I wanted to love Sylvia, but to love her would mean loving someone who would have hated me. It would be a few years after I flunked out of college until I took a class called Women's Literature at a public university down the hill with a teacher named Stephanie who looked a lot like Francois Sagan, teenage author of Bonjour, Christesse, but older and with a cap of gray hair. Margaret Atwood, Toni Morrison, Adrian Rich, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, Plath, Sexton, Lord, Kate Chopin, Alice Walker, Juna Barnes. I was, the, I was beginning to understand, but barely, to ask a pertinent question now and then, like where the hell was Langston Hughes in modern poetry? Dickinson in 19th century American literature. If Hopkins was a modernist, how about Dickinson with her weird rhymes and what Galway Canal called her inner speech-like sliding syncopated rhythm, a counterpoint to her iambic lines, a horse straining at the bit in the direction of free verse. A woman who drove a motorcycle to women's literature wore a fringed black leather jacket and worked at the Kalamazoo airport in the cubicle where people pay for parking, was shot and killed there by her ex-boyfriend. From then on, the class became something else. Stephanie had us over to her house, a damp place in the woods. She roasted a goat and served it to us, shredded on blue plates. The books had become more and less important. We spoke of them huddled on the floor by the fire. I remember most of all, I remember most of all the bushel baskets of apples and grapes for winemaking, drawing fruit flies. I'm not complaining. It was all more than I deserved. The goat, the greenhouse, the liberated blonde badass on her motorcycle, Sula surfacing Sunday morning, ripe plums, my education. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was such a great reading. And thank you all to the poets and to Matthew and the editors for including me. Um, thank you all so much. Um, hello everybody, my name is Jake. Um, and I'll be reading a poem called Anthropocene, a dictionary. And I wish we would end with such a, uh, somber tone or Hopefully this is a gesture toward maybe accountability instead or sustainability, something of the sort. Anthropocene, a dictionary. The Beh Bogan, sheep corral. Juniper beams caught charcoal in the late summer morning. Night still pulled in hoof prints. Deer panicked, run from water. Olje bena adinadin, moonlight. Perched above the town, drowned in orange and street lamp. The road back home dips with the earth, shines black in the sirens. Bit up, its sails or its wings. Driving through the mountain pass, Dolly, mountain bluebird, swings out from swollen branches. I never see those anymore, someone says. Dior, wind, wind, more of it, more wind as in to come up. Plastic bags, driftwood, the fence line. 
Nehut Sui, evening, somewhere northward, fire twists around the shrublands, sky dipped in smoke, twilight. There is a word for this, someone says. They detlid, they burned it. Cordelia, we did this. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, may I propose that uh, Matthew uh, read a poem from from the volume? Oh shit! I'm totally unprepared to do that. <laughs> um, well, I meant Matthew Rohr. <laughs> um oh god um can i can i can i uh take a take a pause on that i, I haven't even thought about it of course i it's a lovely <laughs> offer i just didn't i i was i was so immersed in everybody's amazing readings uh, I didn't, they were yeah. they were wonderful um god it was what a great reading thank you all so much um and what a great way to end jake um but all loved all the poems well, I, I uh, regret taking you by surprise with the question, Matthew, but perhaps you'll think over something that you'd like to, to read. Let me second what you just said. It was wonderful to hear all the poems uh, this evening. And uh, I, I don't know whether people did prepare to read a second poem, which is what Matthew uh, would have liked. Um, I felt that one hour may not be enough time. <clears throat> I certainly enjoyed the, the reading and seeing the reactions of people to the poems was uh, enjoyable as well. Yeah, I don't, I, um, I'd love to hear if the poets have anything they want to say um, at all, you know, I mean, I'm, just about what's on their minds. Well, how about it, Ada? Uh, since I now know how to pronounce your name, uh, I'd love to hear what you would say in answer to that open-ended question. I mean, I think that it was so, it was such a beautiful reading. I feel really moved by everyone's uh, words and I feel like I you know I just got this I literally I don't know if everyone maybe not even everyone's received it I just got it I think yesterday so um, I hope you get it soon and all I can say is that it is um, I'm working my way slowly through it because I'm savoring each poem and I just think tonight has been just an incredible uh, entree into what's offered by the book and um it just, I'm very moved by what every, everyone's poems, just really, really floored by the work that, that everyone's doing. May, may I explain that um, in previous uh, years, when we did not have a pandemic, we were able to uh, get the book into bookstores and people's hands by the end of August, and uh, we've encountered a problem in the last, well, three, three years really, uh, since 2020, with uh, the chain supply chain disruptions that you've all heard about that really uh, have wreaked havoc in publishing. And uh, we're doing our, our best to speed the process up, um, and so on, but it's true. People didn't even get the books until yesterday or today. And so uh, uh, I'm glad that uh, this foretaste of what's in the volume has spurred everyone to want to read it through all the way. There was one thing I forgot to mention, um, which is it would be so great if people ordered from green light tonight using the discount. I mean, we 
uh, are just the beneficiaries of independent bookstore life. And we want to make sure we keep them around for a long, long time. So if you have any urge to read this book, please just use the discount and support them. They're awesome. They do so many good readings and so many great things. And they're just a great, great spot. So, so let's like, let's keep them in business for a long time. I, I wanted to say that, but I got nervous beforehand. So I'm glad I had the chance to say it. Well said. We really do depend on those independent bookstores in particular. Uh, given an industry that becomes more and more uh, centralized with more and more amalgamations of publishing houses and outlets. Speaking of bookstores and and best American poetry, I remember I was I remember being a teenager, like 16, 17. And coming across Best American Poetry 2007, I believe, and then 2008, 2009 at a bookstore, because I grew up on the res, very small town with no bookstores at all. There was only one. And though that those collections were sort of my first sort of glimpse into poetry. And so I just wanted to again thank you all so much for, for including me and sort of hearing my my poems and letting me be part of this chorus of so many amazing poets. It's truly full circle moment for me to sort of be here among these words when so long ago I was sort of like peering through it from between mm. the shelves. Thank you so much. Oh, that's so nice to hear. I remember those books, uh, Heather McHugh's 2007, Charles Wright's 2008, and David Wagoner's 2009 books. <clears throat> you know, Terrence Hayes told me that the very first book of poetry he ever bought was Best American Poetry 1990, which uh, Jory Graham edited, mm. and uh, and Terrence said, "Oh, he owns all the books in the series." Uh, this is when he and I worked together on the 2014 volume. That was great, Jake. I'm I'm real happy to hear it. Since we're giving out testimonials, I'll um, add to what Jake was saying. I grew up in New York. I'm a New York kid, and I would go to the best of American poetry reading every single year. So to be in this um, is like really incredible. I, my sister and I would go every single year and get our books signed by folks and um, dream of being in a volume of best of American poetry. So this is beautiful to be here with all of you. Uh, you mean you used to come to the new school uh, on 12th Street? Absolutely. Oh, uh, yes. we did one every year between 2003 and 2019. Mm -hmm. And then the pandemic came along. Yep, yep. Uh, I've been to probably all of them starting in 2007. Wow. Yeah. Well, just imagine how exciting it was in the green room when we got all the poets together before the reading and everyone signed each other's books and, uh, and we had photographers there and, it, it was very glamorous. Uh, we'll, we'll have that again, I'm sure of it. That's you know, fun. it's it's cool, however, to do it this way too, because probably a Michigan poet wouldn't be able to get to New York or, or be invited. So um, it's nice to see people from all over the place. You, you know, Diane, the first times we did the launch readings, we invited only people in the vicinity of New York. And then it turned out that some people wanted to come. Maybe they were their flights were subsidized or something. But um, I, I said, oh, well, let's invite everyone. And one year we had 42 people, <laughs> really. And it, um, in that auditorium at 66 West 12th Street, um, and, and we couldn't even um, uh, get them all on, on the stage. Um, the uh, alphabetically uh, penalized were in the first row. Uh, <laughs> hmm. it was, that's nice to hear. Camille wants to read a poem. No, Camille was actually saying, I think um, this has been it's such an amazing, beautiful night, but I may have to follow in Major's 
footsteps and step out of this glorious gathering. What a just these poems were just so beautiful. I feel so honored to be like in the company of this amazing poet tonight. And thank you for uh, to Greenlight Books and David and Matthew, your amazing work and all 250 of you out there in <laughs> Zoom land who sat with us. Thank you for being here with and for poetry. So that's what I wanted to say, David. <laughs> Thanks, Camille. It would have been nice to hear a second poem from you. I just got it yesterday too. There's so many po <laughs> poets, poets I love and some poems I, I remember reading when they were in journals or online and being like, that's an amazing poem. So well done, Matthew, for agreeing with me on some of those poems, but also like some I don't know yet. So I'm really excited to sit with it and and come to know some of this great work that's happening in America. Thanks, well, before everybody. Before we head out, oh, I just yeah. wanted to make sure that I said thank you to all of you poets for being here tonight. Thank you for such a wonderful evocative series of readings um, and for taking the time and space to be here with all of us this evening. Um, as traumatic and hard as the past few years have been, um, the pandemic has provided incredible accessibility for events and readings and these kinds of conversations that we never really had before. And, and I'm so grateful to all of you for taking the time to be with us tonight. Um, I'll give one more push. You can buy this collection from Greenlight or from any of your local indies across the country. Um, there's, as we've been saying, wonderful bookstores doing great work all across um, the United States, and they would love that business just as much as we would. Um, but thank you all so much for being here. I'll turn it over to David and Matthew one more time if they have any closing thoughts, but from Greenlight, have a wonderful evening. Thanks so much, Josie. Thank you so much, everybody. Good night, all. We did record this night event, night. so I will share the link moving forward. But have a great night. Thank night. you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.